Welcome back, all you ghosts and goblins, to your favorite podcast, That Would Be Rad, a podcast that majors in 80s and 90s nostalgia, comic culture, all things paranormal, and minors in retro video games, pre-internet mysteries, and raising our kids to be half as cool as we were back in the 80s. We are your hosts, Tyler Bentz. And Woody Brown. What's going on, dude? Well, bro, it's the final episode of the October Spooktacular. And man, do we have an incredible show prepared for our listeners. A collection of horrifying tales so spine-tingling, they're going to swear that they're fiction. That's right, dude. And not just terrifying things that have happened to us in our stories, but a spooky little submission from our listeners. That's right, man. I mean, I think people are going to discover that the truth can sometimes be scarier than fiction. Okay, listeners, put on those headphones, turn out the lights, turn on the volume, and let's get... Spooky. I remember it was either late October or early November. The air was chilly and crisp and the leaves had already changed colors. But it wasn't too cold just yet, and there was still enough leaves on the trees that driving up in the mountains just to see all the reds, oranges, and yellows was a good way to spend a late afternoon. One evening, I decided to throw a few comfy blankets and a sleeping bag or two in the back of my truck and take a girl I was hanging out with to an overlook so we could listen to music, talk about life, and just look up at the stars. The weather was perfect. Chilly enough that, although the blankets would do a pretty good job keeping us warm, we still needed to kind of get nice and close to stay warm. We found the perfect overlook around 8.30 or 9 p.m. No other cars or annoying loud teenagers, just us. I slowly backed my truck into a spot that was angled just right so we could get a great view of the moonlit mountains and the stars above. As I turned the engine off, but left the radio on with the keys in the auxiliary position. We both climbed in the bed of the truck, got snug in our blankets, and started enjoying the view. This was a pivotal time in my life. I was almost done with college, I was in my early 20s, and in my mind, the world was full of opportunity and intrigue. This girl and I talked about life as we listened in the background to one of my favorite albums at the time, Falling by Ben Queller. We laid back, gazing at the beautiful twinkling vastness of the space above. Shh. Did you hear that? She asked. No. What? I responded. I don't know, like a footstep or something. We both sat up. I stood still slowed my breathing, closed my eyes and opened my senses to every little detail. I could hear the wind rustling the leaves above in the trees, and then nothing. No snap of a twig, no footsteps, nothing. I don't hear anything. I bet it was just an acorn or something falling, I said to calm her down. She didn't look very convinced. We sort of stayed quiet for a few minutes, listening to the music, laying back down so we could return to the awe-inspiring, panoramic view of the stars. Oh my God, what was that? She said loudly as she shot up quickly, sitting straight up and looking around. She grabbed the flashlight and nervously pointed it around, the frantic beam of light sweeping through the trees on opposite sides of my truck. Nothing. She was breathing heavily, 
I tried to calm her down, but I could tell she'd had enough. The cold was beginning to get colder than we'd expected, and the blankets weren't really doing their job. On top of that, she was clearly spooked. I need to go to the bathroom real quick, and, and then we can head down the mountain. Cool? Yeah, I mean, we don't have to go. It's, it's fine. I don't know what my deal is. She giggled and asked, Need this? She held out the flashlight. I grabbed it and then I hopped over the bed of the truck without using my hands. One of those kind of stupid ninja moves guys do to impress girls and look tough. I walked to the edge of the woods, which was only about six or seven steps away from the truck. I kept the flashlight off so I could get a little privacy. I could hear Ben Queller in the background, singing from my truck radio. My nose was runny and I could feel my hands and face getting numb and stiff from the cold. Suddenly... I had this overwhelming feeling like something wasn't right. Like I wasn't alone. I looked up and into the vast woods in front of me. I could make out the dark outlines of the pine trees and the bigger oaks and the moonbeams that had peeked through the canopy above. I looked deeper, searching for movement. Nothing. No sounds. In the far distance, my eye caught a small, tiny red dot. By this time I was done going to the bathroom, but I still stood at the edge of those woods. Something just wasn't right. I kept perfectly still, squinting and looking, searching for something. Hey, I... Shh, I said sharply. She went quiet immediately. The tiny red dot was so faint. I couldn't tell if my imagination had created it. It didn't move. It was completely stationary. Nothing changed about it. It was far enough away that I had to squint really hard in the darkness to see it. Then, it did change. It became suddenly brighter and then dim again. Still though, it stayed in the same position it didn't move. It had to be at least 50 to 75 yards away. Once more, it became brighter, this time brighter than before, and quickly dimmed, staying again in the same position. I scrunched my face and squinted my eyes, my mind searching for what I was seeing and what it could possibly be. Was it some sort of nocturnal animal? A bobcat or mountain lion? or even a raccoon, looking for food? Maybe just a reflection of a piece of trash from the moonlight. Then I remembered, I have a flashlight. I flicked the flashlight on and pointed its beam right at where I'd seen the dot. It took both my eyes and my mind a minute to register what I was looking at. There, standing perfectly still, deep within the woods, was... A man, dressed in a white t-shirt with cut-off sleeves and camouflage pants, standing in between the trees, staring straight back at me. The light shined directly in his eyes, yet he didn't blink. He didn't flinch. He had a cigarette in his mouth, and I could now see the faint trail of smoke from within the beam of my flashlight. That was the red glow. I turned around and quickly shouted, Get in the truck! What? Why? Just do it! Hurry! I hustled back to the truck and quickly made my way around the back of the truck to get to the driver's side. As I did, I noticed two things that chilled me to the bone. This all happened so fast that it wasn't until I was seated in the driver's seat that my mind realized what they were. The first was a handprint on the truck bed facing in a way only someone from outside the truck could have made. The print was toward the back of the vehicle, in an area neither of us had touched. It was angled in such a way that it seemed as though someone had peered over the edge to peek at us while we lay there. My flashlight pointed back in the direction of the woods as I rounded the driver's side of the truck, and I could then see a set of boot prints in a direct straight line to where the handprint was on the truck bed and back into the woods. Chills ran up my spine. The hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. Someone had been watching us. 
not only from deep within the woods, but right next to us. Were they under the truck? Were they hiding in front of the truck, waiting for me? I jumped into the driver's side door, slammed it shut, locked it, and turned the key to start the truck. In this moment, I just knew that that strange man from the woods must be closer. And if there was another person there waiting, the one that had peeked in on us, they couldn't be far. This was literally a scene from any one of a million scary movies. I had written our fate. I had led us into this real life horror movie. The battery was dead. All so we could listen to some music. God, what are we gonna do? And then the engine started. I dropped it into drive and stomped on the gas. Gravel flew from behind and the truck tail slid slightly as we tore out of there and onto the curvy mountain road that lay ahead of us. As we quickly sped our way through the curves, I told her what I had seen and she looked back at me horrified. She had felt that feeling that we were being watched the entire time. She then explained that her stepdad, who was a local sheriff, had warned her about being in this area late at night due to the high amount of methamphetamine dealers and manufacturers in the woods. I wondered if that's who the man was. Perhaps a lookout. Perhaps a hopped up lunatic waiting for the right moment to pounce. In this part of the North Georgia mountains, these types of operations, city officials, and sometimes even the police had been known to be part of these crime circles. I looked in the rearview mirror as I pressed on the brakes to see if anyone was following us. Nothing but black, empty road behind us. Slow down, she said, almost in shock. As we rounded the corner, I could see a flashing red light coming through the trees. Ahead of us was a fire truck, blocking most of the road, and a group of firefighters standing in the road. No other vehicles, no fire, nothing. We came to a stop. No one approached our vehicle. No firemen, no signals. It was almost as if we weren't even there. I didn't really want to roll down my window and ask what was going on. Honestly, I was too afraid of the answer. Had someone driven off this mountain road? Did the man in the white sleeveless shirt use a radio to call ahead and block the road? Were these firemen part of this strange plot to capture me and this pretty girl? As my impatience and frustration came to a head, I began to roll the window down, and one of them began waving his arm, signaling us to slowly drive through the small gap that was available. We both looked as we passed and still couldn't determine what they were doing. We breathed a collective sigh of relief. We even giggled a bit as we continued down the curvy mountain road, heading back into town. Minutes passed, and we were both silent going over the strange and scary things that had happened. She grabbed my hand and squeezed it, smiled and said, This might be the craziest, weirdest date I've ever been on. I looked over for a split second at her, smiled and said, Said it was a date. She was smiling, but looking directly ahead when she yelled, Stop! I slammed on my brakes and we came to a screeching halt. In front of me, in the middle of the road, was a man. He held a baby carrier in one of his hands and was holding his other hand up in a signal to stop right there in the middle of the road. I couldn't believe this. Are you freaking kidding me? What should I do? Does this guy have a baby out in the cold? Is this another part of this plan for some hillbilly drug murderers to get us? What is going on here? I slowly moved forward. The man moved to the side of the road and I slowly drove closer. Now he was right beside my passenger door. I rolled the window down slightly and he said, Hey, can you give us a ride back into town? My wife just is just around the corner. Our, our car isn't riding and we're stranded. As I'm telling you this, I honestly don't know why I said yes. I suppose it was the idea of this 
a little baby being out on this cold night, so late and so dark and so far away from any town. I told him to get in the back of the truck. I rolled up the window and the girl whispered, What in the hell are you doing? He's got a baby. What was I supposed to do? There's no baby in that carrier. My heart sank. We went around curve after curve. No one. Nothing up ahead. I've done it again, I thought. And then we saw them. In the headlights, standing on the side of the road. A woman and a girl who appeared to be around five or six. I slowed down and they hopped in the back. Still, no baby. I drove slowly around the curves, still looking in the rear view to try and catch them doing something weird each time that I pressed on the brakes. We sat silent in the cab as we got closer and closer to town. Finally, we made it to the closest 24-hour store. We pulled into the giant parking lot. Come in the store with me, I told the girl. You go ahead, go in. I'll tell these folks that this is where we'll have to leave them. They can ask to use a phone inside, stay warm, until someone comes to help them. She agreed and went inside. I got out and explained to the family that this would be a great spot for them. They could get help and stay inside. They thanked me and I went inside the store. The girl was waiting for me near the only entrance. I quickly used the bathroom and she waited there by the entrance of the store, ready to leave. It may have only been, I don't know, five minutes. I came out and as we exited the store, the family was nowhere to be found. Did they come in after me after I was in the bathroom? No one came in after you. Where could they have gone? A small family like that wouldn't have been able to get across this giant, well-lit parking lot that quickly. And there was only one entrance to this store open, so it would have been impossible for her to miss them coming into the entrance after me. We looked all around the parking lot. Nothing. I drove her home, both of us just eager to be done with the night. Freaked out and ready for the sunrise, I dropped her off and drove quickly to my apartment. Weeks later, I was retelling the story to a mutual friend of the girl and I. He was mostly laughing and teasing me about being paranoid, but then when I got to the part about the family on the side of the road, his face turned white. Hold on, he said. He grabbed his phone, dialed a number, and waited for someone to pick up on the other end. I looked at him, completely confused. As I went to ask him what was going on, he held up his finger and said, "Hey mom, I'm going to put you I'm going to put my buddy Woody on the phone. He's got a story that you need to hear." "Hello?" I said. On the other end was my friend's mother who listened to my entire story in silence. When I was done, she paused and asked just one question. "Did you shake his hand?" I was confused, but chills ran through my entire body. I searched my memory. No, I hadn't. No, ma'am, I said. She cleared her throat and said, Growing up in that area, there was a terrible accident on that stretch of road. A man, woman, and their two children were killed. People every now and then see them on that road, asking for a ride. I couldn't breathe. I was in complete shock. I think you and that girl, well, I think you saw that family that night. Hey, hey, can you give us a ride back in the town? My wife just just around the corner. 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 Cars and riot and riot and restraining. There's no baby in that carrier. Dude, I had totally forgotten about that entire story. Mm-hmm. Like, I briefly remember the, you know, teen makeout sash moment, but I totally <laughs> forgot about the hitchhiker family. Yeah, man. I mean, really, truthfully, that might be the craziest night 
uh, of my life, man. I mean, just it was just like one thing after the oh, other. Yeah. I mean, if if it was a signal that uh, both that girl and I should probably discontinue dating, um, then it was a pretty strong mm-hmm. one. Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, what were you thinking when you hop off the truck, walk over to the, the wood line, I guess, mm-hmm. and you see the little cherry of a cigarette? Well, I mean, dude, here's what's crazy, okay? Like, the whole time we were out there, uh, this girl just kept on just kind of just being, like, overly, like, skittish. Mm-hmm. Like, what was that, you know? And usually I'm the one that's, like, on high alert. Yeah. I mean, you know me. You dude. 100% so, uh, are. I was surprised that I was like, well, if I didn't hear it, then, you know, there's there's nothing to worry about, mm-hmm. right? Well, truthfully, man, when I first saw this little, like, weird kind of glow in the distance in the woods, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I, my, my eye, it kind of caught my eye, but it didn't, <laughs> there's no way in the world, you know, once I shine my light on it that I expected to see a freaking man. Mm-hmm. And it was like, he was like, I mean, in the woods, man. So... Right away, that's terrifying. That this dude's just standing there staring from a distance. And why in the heck is he in there? What's he yeah. doing? Why isn't he like when I say like he didn't flinch, he didn't move. When the light is shining in his eyes, dude. You know, you know, when you guys were over here uh, for like a little Halloween party, and our kids were just shining flashlights in our eyes and just blinding the. Heck oh, out I of lost us. it on my daughter. For like immediate <laughs> shining a light in my eyes. <laughs> yeah, man. Immediately, immediately, it's like oh god. You know, you kind of want to look away yeah. or at least. Close your eyes. Mm-hmm. This guy dead stare. Man. Well, not only that, but then he. Uh, I, I think I remember you telling me years ago that that when you first saw the light, like I guess because you didn't have sort of a um, like a like a sort of spatial awareness set. So you even you even said that you thought that it could be like a cell phone tower light or like something just, way exactly. off because it's so small. Yep. Exactly. Um, yeah, man. And I just, you're right. I didn't know kind of that, the the way that the woods went. So exactly the same thing. It, it seemed like maybe one of those, you know, lights far off uh, in the mountains with the cell phone towers, but it scared me so bad that I yelled, get in the truck, mm-hmm. I whip around. And that's when I saw kind of like the footprints that led oh off into the gosh. woods. And then that handprint on yeah, the truck, dude, that's you know, because like, you know, at night when like the moisture kind of builds up on the truck, that was the handprint that was left. There's no way in the world that it could have been one of ours. Plus, I saw those footprints going in a, in a direction that like I didn't just come mm-hmm. from. And I was the only one. So she, later, as we were kind of going down the mountain, man, she was kind of talking about that she felt like at some point she felt like she had heard somebody just like standing there. But when she oh like freaked out and looked up, like nobody was around. So like, I'm not joking. I have no idea if they were under the truck. I have no idea if this guy, if, if, if that was the person that I saw in the woods, if he had come up, I have no idea if he had like somebody else with him. Mm. And so, and then of course, of course, man, in classic scary movie fashion, I try to start my truck. Oh, and yeah. It doesn't turn over. I mean, it's like straight out of a movie. movie. Like it really was. And she's just like, you know, just screaming like, oh my God. And I'm just like, be quiet. Nothing's happening. So, so when and, you, when you jumped back in the truck, did you tell her what you saw in the woods or are you just kind of panicking trying to like, yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I did. Yeah. She was just kind of like, what's happening? What's going on? Mm-hmm. What, what, what? She just knew that I was just like, get in the truck and that I don't mess around. I'm, this isn't a joke, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, so she's kind of like, what did you see? And as the, the truck's trying to, you know, crank up i basically tell her like look there was somebody out in the woods i saw a a set of footprints and a handprint on her truck i think there's somebody out here and she's like oh my god and then i'm just like and finally it it um starts and i mean i peeled out of there man alive and we're just going i mean i was taking these curves coming down this (laughs) mountain way too fast and uh in in truth i didn't even think about it being paranormal until i was at my friend's house Mm -hmm. and kind of telling him that story and then literally, man, he was just like, hold on a second. Called his mom up, made me start from the beginning, didn't say a word. She didn't say a word. And then, you know, she she let me finish and was just like, told me the story about, you know, this family, people seeing these ghosts mm-hmm. often on that stretch of road. Man. And that she had seen them one time. Um, and she's just like, I mean, I think that's who you saw. Jeez. And I mean, I was just... You know, that's really like the main, the major sort of scary thing that's ever happened. I mean, dude, that's, you know, it's (laughs) the funny thing is, though, is it's such a good story and it's such a scary situation that, I mean, it's almost like the powers that be orchestrated it. So it's like, okay, this guy's going to have the most mundane life 
ever, <laughs> and we're going to pack it all into one night. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's crazy. God. It is crazy. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, the one thing, especially going back to the, um, I mean, I don't know, maybe he was a meth head, maybe not. I mean, you did mention, which was one thing that jumped out, that uh, that it was getting like too cold to even lay out there, but then the dude had like a t-shirt on or sleeveless. Oh, did you cut off yeah. sleeves, man? A white t-shirt, nothing. Yeah, else. I mean, we're like getting too cold with blankets. We're inside of the sleeping bag, mm-hmm. and then blankets on top of that. Yeah, and we're too cold. And this guy's just standing out there in the woods with just a t-shirt on that doesn't even have yeah. sleeves. Yeah, and, well, and and to me, the scariest part, just the thought of like somebody sort of like peeking around the corner of like the wall or the staircase or something. You know, that, you know, with those handprints, I mean, that kind of sounds like what he was doing, mm-hmm. which, oh, yeah, my man. God. Just so scary, dude. Mm. All right. So we had several submissions mm-hmm. from our listeners uh, over the past yep. few weeks. And, you know, I got to be honest, man, all of them were just amazing. Yeah. Um, but we decided what we really wanted to do is kind of like the beginning of a tradition here is pick whatever story really kind of stood out to us as like the most terrifying we wanted to kind of tell the rest of the listeners right Mm -hmm. and so for us it was pretty clear yeah pretty clear Mm -hmm. winner i agree yeah this is a guy who um has kind of been a fan and a uh, a friend over on my art page he just seamlessly sort of moved over uh onto our page whenever we started the podcast Mm -hmm. and he's been i mean he's super loyal uh great back and forth and you know unexpectedly had one of the best stories of the bunch. It's terrifying, and I can't wait uh, I can't wait for people to hear it. Let's do it. Okay, let me put the cassette in. Before I press play, first, a word from our sponsors. You will know it is time to turn the page when you hear the chimes ring like this. Let's begin now. Growing up in the Midwest, I experienced a lot of high weirdness or things I couldn't explain. When I was a child, I was often plagued by this strange feeling that only came around during the night. I can't really explain what it is, but it was akin to maybe a reverse vertigo in which my room would open up to the night sky and I would suddenly have this very strange feeling that I was very, very, very small and infinitesimal and almost falling in and out of my body simultaneously. I never really thought about this. I just thought it was something caused by an overactive imagination. These incidences where the strange vertigo-like sensation only happened at night. But this day I was playing in a room that was not my own bedroom and I was playing on the floor and I felt this strange sensation again. Then I also felt like there was a second presence in the room. I got up off the floor and I looked onto the bed and on the bed was a man laying there. Not an old man, but maybe a younger man, maybe college age. He had a goatee, didn't really look familiar to me at all. He kind of woke up and then looked at me. I kind of ducked down at the foot of the bed and then I slowly peeked back over and looked at him from the foot of the bed. And he sat bolt right up in his bed and said, who in hell are you? you? I jumped up, I ran out of the room. I didn't see him when I ran, but I could have swore he was there. I got my parents to look. We checked the house for anybody else, but nobody else was there. So again, my parents chalked this up for an overactive imagination. I didn't really think about this incident. You grow up, you go through things, you forget a lot of stuff. Years later, I was home from college and I was very, very sick. I had caught in some sort of flu or virus or something like that. 
And so I was doing a lot of sleeping and a lot of running back and forth to the bathroom. And one of the things that happened was I was laying in my room and I started getting the bed spins again. And I was worried because I thought, oh, I'm going to be sick or something like that. And I woke up or I opened my eyes and I looked at the foot of my bed and there was a very small person there looking up at me. And so, you know, getting caught off guard, I yelled out, who in hell are you? Hell are you? And this person ducked down and I went to the foot of my bed and we're gone. Now, I don't know what that was. I don't know. That's a, you know, part of my self that was in like a fever dream or something strange had happened. But I've always thought of it as like some sort of time dilation. But then later on in life, when I've moved out of my childhood home, I would often have strange situations in which people would be in my house or in my room that weren't there. The most memorable one was I woke up in the middle of the night. I felt as if somebody was there watching me. I looked to my bedroom door, which was open, and crawling across the ceiling was a person. And this person was a female. And she was looking, her face was looking at the ceiling as she was crawling. But when she noticed that I noticed she, she was there, she turned her complete head around and looked at me. And that freaked me out. Again, I screamed. I ran around to see who that was or what it was. But there was nothing there. So these are just some of my strange happenings that have happened in my own life. And I haven't even told you about my brother who saw Bigfoot or my dad who saw a UFO. So, man, okay. A couple things to unpack really quickly here on this one. First off, Clay, <laughs> dude, thank you so much. You, you completely outdid yes, yourself. Yes, sir. Um, it was uh, it was outstanding. I know the rest of our audience loved it just as much as we did, and just absolutely terrifying mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons. Um, I mean, one, I think I'm right there with you, Clay, and, and thinking there's some sort of, you know, I don't know, Tyler. What do you think? Like as far as like the time thing goes, because it, it seems to me like he was literally as a kid seeing his older mm -hmm. self, and then. And then later when he's college age, seeing himself as a little, he, he's, he's experiencing that moment in right. life, you know, two times, but yeah. essentially at the same time. Uh, it's crazy. It was interesting to hear his take on it because I think it's something that um, I definitely kind of believe along these lines, lines of thinking. And I think you do too, where, you know, there's a belief that, that time isn't quite as linear as we think. And so you hear these stories. I don't think I've given it on the podcast before, but We've talked about it. There, there's a story that I ran across uh, several years ago where it was it was really interesting because it was a woman who... Wait, have I told the story before on the air? I don't know. So basically there's a woman, her mom passes away. She's at, uh, goes back to her old home place and um, they're cleaning up everything. And she happens to walk in one of the back bedrooms and she sees what looks like two little girls. And she panics and runs back out. Mm. Well then... Oh, yes. You remember this? Oh, well, God. Man, you've told me this. I don't remember if we talked about this on the show. I don't show. either. But basically, the the woman goes to, and I think it was years later, the lady goes to the aunt, her mother's sister. You know, she thinks the house is haunted because she walks in and there's like what looks like two little girls and then they vanish. Well, then her aunt, you know, who's an old woman at this point, says, well, you know, there was this time when me and your mother, and apparently the house was actually the house, the same house that, the mother and the and her sister, the aunt, grew up in. And so she says, you know, there was one time where um, we were playing a board game in, what, in the same back room, and all of a sudden the door swung open and we saw a lady, and then she disappeared. And so it's kind of, it, as soon as I heard Clay's story, it immediately reminded me of that, mm -hmm. where it's like this sort of, um, 
you know, it's definitely time dilation, but it's sort of uh, how retro causality works, where it's like one thing is sort of informing the other, and they're just sort of jumbling up like the events in in sort of the the flow of time, I guess, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're looking at it linearly, I think that's exactly what happened. As far as the lady on the ceiling, that that's just that's just straight up terrifying. It is so you know, terrifying. It reminded me of um, there's a scene in Train Spotting. Oh where yeah, he's having like that hallucination mm-hmm. while he's like I guess coming down off heroin yep. or something, and there's like a baby like crawling on the ceiling. Yeah, I, I'm not joking. The first time I watched that movie, mm-hmm. I think I was either I may have been by myself or something, and I saw that I totally didn't expect something to be completely terrifying, yeah. and I saw that part, and I was like, well, I need to go find Ernest Saves Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> put that in that's my go-to yeah. man but that's kind of what that reminded me of it's like so many elements of absolute terror mm-hmm. i mean you just see this person and then and then all of a sudden the head just uh, turns around uh, and, and i don't think that's gross. a um anything to do with time dilation i think that is just 100 percent paranormal Scary. haunted yeah whatever mm-hmm. yeah and i mean you know so he's out in the midwest mm-hmm. and uh I don't know. Anytime we've been up to the Midwest, it's like, you know, especially some of those older homes. Oh, dude, the Lincoln um, Lodge. Oh, my gosh. Do you remember that? Why didn't we tell that I, story? I just, it Goodness. literally just popped into my head. We'll have to tell it another time. Yeah. I mean, that's a, man, whew, that was, that place, I mean, it was like The Shining mixed with, uh, what, man? I mean, I mean, number one, it was it's the, well, let's get into it a little bit. It's the world's longest, I mean, it has to be, longest motel or hotel, I guess hotel? I guess they're all inside. I guess inside, but man, this place was. And it was in Indiana. It was either like right there on the border of Indiana and Illinois. Yeah. but I think it was in Indiana because that was something that we were sort of mm-hmm. like kind of laughing about. And then like we get there, and it just the decor alone. I mean, just seemed straight like seventies. Yeah, I mean, kind of like the seventies, yeah. very much like The Shining. It was completely empty. So the reason why we even pulled off to go to this hotel, we were touring mm-hmm. the midwest at that point and then heading over to the northeast but that was the midwest leg of the tour and it started it was the first snow of the mm-hmm. year well for everybody that lives in the south the first snow of the year might be a couple of <laughs> you know centimeters or a couple of maybe. just flurries just in general just a dusting yeah. and we're all outside just going like this is the greatest year of my yeah. life I finally got to see some snow <laughs> dad so when we hear that on the radio or whatever we're like oh no big mm-hmm. deal there were like snowflakes the size of, uh, you know, queen bed blankets falling yeah. on our van. And we're yeah, just huge. like scared to death. We don't know what to do. So we're just like, we got to find the first hotel. And this happened to be the one. So we get there, you know, there's nobody else in the parking lot. Right? Yeah. Hmm. You know, not a bad sign necessarily, but an interesting one. Mm-hmm. We go inside, you know, it's got like the vacancy sign. If I remember right outside, it's kind of like, gzz, 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 yep. you know, um, wood but, paneling, just yeah, everywhere. wood paneling everywhere. Weird seventies colors, very odd choices uh, back mm-hmm. then. Um, Weird. Like, like, um, like portraits of like presidents mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah. And then the front desk, it was one of those places where, you know, and I never, this doesn't ever make me feel comfortable. And I like to feel comfortable whenever I go into a, <laughs> into a place that I'm going to lay my head down. Yeah. So like the front desk is completely partitioned off by like bulletproof plexiglass of glass mm-hmm. on all sides. And I'm yep. like, hmm, interesting, but okay. I'm kind of like, uh, yes, sir. Uh, one room, please. Doesn't really say much. Gives us the key. We go to the room and well, it is like. Well, you're, you're leaving out also that you walk in the door, which is like at the very center of the hotel. Mm-hmm. You look to your right, and it's like a hallway that's half a mile long mm. to your right. You look to your left, it's another half a mile long. I, I mean, about that. who yeah, knows yeah. how many rooms were in this place? Oh, God. And then, so we get to the room, you know, we get in there. I want to say, dude, there was only, was it just one, like, giant bed that we all had to just, like, cram into? <laughs> I don't remember, dude, but it was Maybe. like, you know, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. We all just want to yeah. go to sleep, so we don't really care. We're sleeping on the floor. We're sleeping in chairs, whatever. But mm-hmm. the room is tiny. There's, there's no there. heat also. It's only just a a wall heater. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was yeah, freezing. Like one of those old, um, it looks like a, a uh, like a radiator. Yeah, like right. Like a radiator heat thing. And of, of course, we probably just didn't know how to turn it on, honestly. It's like, <laughs> what do you mean? You guys don't have central heat in this freaking dump? Anyway, yeah. honestly, dude, I don't even remember if there was a bathroom in this place. Like, no, there was. Because it was, it was so cold. And I remember the water. So Boo Boo, our bass player, Shout out to Chris Martin, if mm-hmm. you're listening. He, I think, got the shower first for some reason, which 
usually he was the last to wake up, but mm-hmm. I think he got the shower first. And so for all of us, I think we had to take cold showers. Dude, I remember why, man. I remember why he was the first one. He didn't sleep <laughs> at all. He said oh, that, maybe that he said that yeah. he was just like staring at the door the whole time because one thing that I haven't said yet was we get in there, we close the door. You know, usually you get in a hotel room and they've got the little latch mm-hmm. uh, or maybe like the little like thing to make sure that oh, if somebody yeah. opens the door. Mm-hmm. Well, they had a latch, but unfortunately you could tell that it had been the door, this door, our door, mm-hmm. at some point in the distant past or in the current present had been kicked open yeah, and forced open in some way because that mm-hmm. little latch thing was completely broken, not working. And then we go to like kind of lock the door and it's just janky as it comes in. And so yeah. we were just like, ah, oh, whatever. We put some stuff in front of the door, boo-boo didn't sleep at all and so for the first time ever and ever since he was the first one to uh to take a shower uh what one one weird thing though about that is um and i just thought of this why i mean the parking lot's completely empty i mean we were literally the only people only staying people. in this in this hotel why do they give and us that room bro why do they give us that room and that's and the other thing was it's like it wasn't like the closest room to the desk mm-hmm. it was like way down the hall mm-hmm. that's interesting wow well, yeah. Interesting and scary. Very scary. They must have known we were packing our switchblades, dude. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, that was a crazy experience. Um, And I'm not real sure why we went into that, but I'm glad that we did. Next up, and here's the thing. I was thinking about this. I know that you've told me some of this story before, Mm -hmm. but I'm fairly certain either I didn't know all of it or maybe I just forgot all the details. But your story... Oh my God. Let, let, let's just, we got to just press play on this. Yeah. If you're listening, get ready to be spooked because this scared the heck out of me. When I was very, very young, my parents divorced and I didn't see my dad for several years. I'm terrible with the concept of time in my youth, so I'm sure I'm mistelling this. But around the age of six or seven, my dad came back into my life. He had custody every other weekend, and during his absence, he had remarried a woman that lived near Athens, somewhere between Watkinsville and Elberton, Georgia. The house was huge and ancient to me. A winding staircase, a dumbwaiter, a library at the end of the upstairs hallway, acres of land, a jacuzzi, and a pool. This place was amazing. Looking back, I really can't put an age on the house, though but I'm guessing it was at least built somewhere in the late 1800s. Everything inside was old, polished, and creaky wood. But living near the granite capital of the world, Elberton, Georgia, the exterior was all granite from top to bottom. It took me a while to get used to my surroundings, but mostly everything was pleasant. I had new toys and plenty of new places to explore. My room was upstairs at the end of the hall on the left. When you walked in, To your immediate left, there was an old cedar closet. I would find out years later that there were wooden planks on the back wall of the closet and that it was the only access into the attic. From the entrance of my room to the right was where my bed was, diagonally across the room from the closet. Even as a kid, I had discernment and knew when things didn't feel right or when places just felt off. My room was great, and I remember spending hours drawing on the floor or playing this brand new game called a Nintendo, but only in the day, or if I had a friend over to spend the night. Even then, though, most nights I slept on the couch in the living room downstairs. I guess since it was a new arrangement for all of us, it was never really questioned, and so I'd stay up late, drawing and watching movies until I passed out. After several years of this, I was greeted and told one weekend that I was getting older, There was a brand new bedroom suit, and then I would be sleeping in my own bed in my own room from here on. As a kid especially, I hated confrontation, so I put on a smile and feigned excitement while my stomach sank upon hearing the news of my new sleeping arrangements. I'm sure there's been many things blocked out of my childhood or forgotten with age, but I can still remember the nervous feeling of counting down the hours and minutes until bedtime. I never let on to my dad or new stepmom that anything was wrong, especially since I could tell that they had put so much into making the room comfortable while both tucking me in. I don't remember much about falling asleep, 
but I'll never forget what happened next when I was awakened in the middle of the night. I remember waking to the sound of an old, creaky doorknob, slowly turning in the direction of the closet across the room. I think it took me a moment to fully realize that I was awake when I opened my eyes, but when I did, I was immediately frozen with terror. Across the room, I could see the closet door slowly opening. Once the door was fully open, a tall, maybe six or seven foot tall, black silhouette stepped out and began to creep across the room in my direction, only to land at the foot of my bed. I remember being so terrified and so frozen with fear that I didn't move a muscle. Lying on my back with my head facing up at the ceiling, I was watching all of this through partially closed eyes to not let on that I was awake. I remember this thing standing there, almost like it was watching me. Motionless for the most part until it would move slightly, like a person shifting their weight and standing in the same position for too long. The faint street light just outside the window illuminated the room just enough to see a very, very subtle, almost sheen on the figure, similar to my Aunt Linda's velvet Elvis paintings. Other than that, this thing was more black than night and completely featureless from head to toe. As the time passed on with what seemed like an eternity, I can still remember being drenched with sweat under the covers. I remember the panicked feeling and fear that my childhood asthma would kick up and I would be forced to move because of an asthma attack. I remember praying to God under my breath and making peace because I really didn't believe I would make it till morning. The last thing I remember as all of these feelings and thoughts crescendoed in my nine or 10 year old mind were tears rolling down my cheeks as I lay there motionless in a completely silent room just before I fell asleep. Still to this day, I question if I passed out from shock or if that thing was somehow able to put me under. As an almost 40-year-old adult now that's been somewhat obsessed with the paranormal, the thought of me just falling asleep or passing out after the incident is an all-too-common occurrence that actually seems to happen a lot with most of these shadow people or hatman encounters. After this happened, I figured out ways of getting out of going to my dad's house for a long, long time. It became a huge source of anxiety that I kept to myself for years before telling anyone. And even when I did end up going back to the house, I would always find a way to fall asleep on the couch downstairs. I never had the misfortune of seeing that shadowy figure again. But when I'm alone, or when I wake up for no reason in the middle of the night, while my family is fast asleep, Every now and then, I could almost swear that I could still hear that old, creaky doorknob turning. And somewhere in the house, the door is opening, and a featureless, ink-black shadow is still looking for that little boy from all those years ago. Okay, man, right out of the gate, I've got a few questions for you. Okay. All right, number one. Well, first off, everyone listening is in in agreement with me. After hearing that, that is freaking terrifying. You know, there's something about like being a kid and something scary happened to you. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm a scaredy cat, but I'm very thankful that nothing really terrifying like that ever happened to me. I had some recurring nightmares. By the Mm -hmm. way, I I watched uh, both Hellraiser 1, Hellraiser 2. It's not... Ah. Uh, recurring nightmare. It's close-ish, but it's not. It's not what man. I'm thinking of. Yeah. I really had my hopes up. Me too, man. Okay. Anyway, number one, did you ever end up like telling your dad about what was going on or anything that you experienced there, or did you just kind of? No, I mean, like I said, I was, you know, I was just one of those kids who I just, and I, you know, I don't know if this comes from being a, you know, a product of divorce or whatever, but. You know, especially as a kid, I was just, I always wanted everything to get, to be, you know, cool and Mm -hmm. like. Nice uh, and smooth. Yeah, nice and smooth. I mean, you'll even remember 
you know, back in the band days, if like, if there was like conflict, I was mm-hmm. always the first to like crack a joke and try to make things like funny. So it sort yeah. of lightens the situation. Annoying. <laughs> yeah. Or like get the argument started and then have me like, come on, what do you, you, you know what I'm talking about? I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not doing the conflict for you, bro. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was just the kid who kind of wanted everything to, to go smooth. It was a weird situation because not that I've had like the greatest relationship with my dad but like you know he came back into my life and then you know and it was several years and then it was like at the time I could really tell that he was he was trying to make things as good as possible and to make mm-hmm. me as as comfortable as possible and you know then there was like the new stepmom and um I I think <laughs> I don't think that, you know I don't think they ever had an, any clue that you know either the house was haunted or that anything like that was was going on you know for them they were they're really excited it was like oh you're you know you're getting older now you're a young man you need to start mm-hmm. even though I mean I was nine or ten or whatever but um, you know I think it was just sort of like okay this kid sleeps on the couch every weekend and we need to have some sort like a of, real bed for him you know like a, yeah right plus you know kids will go back and tell their mom like i mean dad's got me sleeping on the damn right. couch i don't even have my own room over there mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah for sure well was was this like the key moment that kind of got you into the paranormal thing like studying about it trying to figure out what it was or did this happen like as you were already kind of interested in this kind of stuff um so well it's funny i i, le- I actually mentioned my aunt linda um she was obsessed with Elvis. So she had the, you know, some of those velvet Elvis paintings mm-hmm. um, up in her, like what she called the Elvis room. So that's how I knew what sort of the texture and the sheen of velvet, you know, looked like. But so I grew up in rural Cleveland, Georgia, which is, you know, really blue collar, um, you know, a lot of just hard work and normal Southern good, you know, just folks that, and they don't really talk about this stuff. And so then there was my Aunt Linda who, she was a medic in the military, had this weird bone disease where she like broke all of her bone, like her bones would break, they're really brittle. You know, it was just her and she was living off of like whatever her military stipend or whatever. And she never remarried, never married. And, um, you know, she was really big into like Stephen King and she introduced me to the, the just the concept of these paranormal things. And so when I was little, um, you know, I was the first to want to check out books on the Loch Ness Monster and, and Dracula and, you know, all these kind of things. And, and I, I loved ghost stories. And she was a brilliant storyteller. And all, all the my cousins and stuff, we would always spend the night at her house, um, my cousin Colt and Haley. And, you know, we'd be in the bed and she would tell us ghost stories to, oddly enough, to put us to sleep at night. Mm-hmm. You know, she was the one who kind of got me into that stuff. But, you know, up to that point, it was... The idea of like the quote unquote paranormal to me was, I mean, it was just sort of like fun and, you know, these like cryptids and Bigfoot and, and sure. you know, all these kind of things. But when this happened, it sort of opened my eyes to a whole new idea of like, mm-hmm. oh, no, 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 this is, this is, I mean, it's still to this day the, the scariest moment of, of my entire life. Yeah, man. I mean, just imagining it like, and that's what I love about just storytelling in general, but mm-hmm. just kind of like, kind of what we get excited about doing for the audience is kind of putting them there with us. But, you know, thinking about that through the eyes of a nine year old, I mean, you know, God, I mean, that's just terrifying, dude. And and not being like having that feeling of just not being able to escape. And, yeah. you know, meanwhile, it's probably just your stepmom in a new velvet suit that she was just making sure you're doing okay. You know, <laughs> she's just, she's just checking out the surroundings. Just checking on them. <sighs> Oh, God. great Jeez. sound design, by the way, thank on this you, episode. Yeah, man. Really, so, really so spooky, man. As a kid, um, I had asthma like really bad, like to the point where I always had to have, you know, I was a kid in the 80s movies with the inhaler. <laughs> and like one time I left it at home at school and they had to put me in the freezer um, <laughs> to slow my heart rate and like so I wouldn't hyperventilate. So I was that kid. And usually it would, you know, my asthma attacks would kind of kick up if I was around like cats or you know, dust or whatever. Um, or if I was like overexert, like running around and, but yeah, it was definitely like a legitimate fear when I was laying there. And I mean, I can still remember just the tears rolling down my cheeks. I remember just covered in sweat because I was just, I just like refused to move. And the scariest thing, and it's, it's weird because in my memory, I'm viewing it as a person laying down, you know, looking up at the ceiling, uh, laying on their back. And so 
it's almost like I was seeing all this like slightly through like my periphery kind of deal, mm-hmm. which for some reason it it makes it even scarier. Was this the main kind of thing that's happened to you or like haven't you I feel like yeah, I mean haven't you had some like other kind of crazy stuff happen to? Like yeah, a- I I had well, I've had a few. One of the most sort of notable ones was I lived in like a loft that was like close to my house where my mom lived. And um I had sort of these situations with these, you know, now we we call them orbs. Um but back then, I mean, you know, this would have been back in like 2005 or whatever. This was something that it was kind of difficult to find anything, only on forums. So basically, you know, I I think it sort of the the concept of these orbs uh, sort of deserves its own episode, um, mm-hmm. and I know I'm sort of burying the lead on here, but uh, but I think we're gonna do a full episode on it and um, yeah. you know really dive in there. But yeah, um, I couldn't I couldn't remember. I, I felt like you had told me that before, something along those lines. I remember some of that stuff, but yeah, dude, we have to do a whole episode on that, man. I've had several things happen throughout my life that um, I you know I I feel like I'm pretty. I'm pretty lucky, I guess, in a way, because a lot of people just wish they could see, you know, see a UFO once or, you know, see a ghost or, you know, whatever. But And only when I really started thinking about this stuff, it's like, well, I'm, I'm actually pretty, pretty blessed to have been able to sort of, you know, encounter a lot of this stuff. Actually, around the same time that I started seeing these orbs in my old loft, there was one night where, you know, now I'm almost 40, so I wake up constantly in the middle of the night. But back then I would just sleep through the night. And there was one night where I woke up straight out of bed. It was probably around 3.30, I'm sure, as it happens. Mm-hmm. And um, the area that we lived in was, you know, like I said, Cleveland, Georgia. We lived in like a really rural area. There was woods. There was a window uh, that you could look look out of the back of the loft that I was in. It was like a little pasture, but then woods surrounding and, and a creek and all that stuff. And um, so I wake up one night. And I don't really know why even, but I immediately get up and I just had this feeling like I had to go to the back window. I walk over to the back window across the room. I look down because it was, it was kind of on a hill. So uh, it was like the upstairs of the loft. And then I look down and I just see this sort of, it looks like somebody wearing like a white hood or like a white sort of robe. It was kind of hard to see because the moon wasn't really out, but it was, it was definitely like a, something that was white and it, you know, it wasn't transparent like a ghost or anything. I mean, it just looked like just a figure that was white. And as soon as I looked down and I saw this thing, the weirdest thing is it's like it it just started moving, but it didn't have any kind of, like it didn't have a gait like it was walking or anything. Like it just, it like was almost floating like... floating kind of? Well, yeah, it was almost like, I guess the only way to describe it is it's almost like um, like it was on like tracks, like a train track almost. Mm. And it just sort of like glides around and so it kind of like just starts moving and it moves out of view and so I can't see it anymore out of the back window well I run to the front window I I stick my head out because the direction it's going is it's you know we said on the last couple episodes is uh, my grandmother lived just down the hill and so I couldn't really see anything and I'm still looking and I'm just like hoping that I can still catch a glimpse of this thing and just when I'm about to come back through the window her motion light comes on and I see this like white, I mean, it looks kind of like the shape of a person. Um, again, I was looking down like two stories, so I don't, I don't know if it was really tall or really short or what, but her motion light comes on, which definitely meant that there was, it was not like a, a ghost. It was, it was something that had enough substance or material that it set off a motion sensor and then the light mm-hmm. came on and then I see it just keep on rolling like it was on a track, just go right you know, out of view, like under the light, under where her light was. And then that was it. And I have no idea what this thing was. I, I looked it up into, in like forums and stuff. And apparently I guess there was an old, um, uh, so we kind of live at the, at the, if you say rural, rural again, (laughs) man, I swear to God. (laughs) Yeah. I think we both say rural really bad, but, um, no, it's a, uh, we kind of live in like the, Appalachia, I guess, sort of the beginnings of the Appalachian, the Appalachian Trail. Trail. Yeah, pretty close to it, yeah. And so there's a thing that is referred to as um, what they call like granny magic or 
Appalachian mountain magic. And they actually talk of this thing where I think they would call it a white shadow. To them, all those years ago, they just, it was just another, you know, haint or haunt or a I think they looked at it as like some sort of ghost or whatever, but I've never been able to find anything. I mean, I've looked for years. Um, I actually, I was on an episode with Timothy Renner, his Strange Familiar podcast, and I talked about it. Basically, I went on that podcast just to see if, I mean, he, you know, he knows a ton about this stuff, and I was hoping that he could give me something, you know, that mm-hmm. he knew about. But, I mean, even even someone like him, he, he was like, yeah, I've never I've never heard of like a white shadow or, or anything like that, but... Um, yeah, it was really bizarre, especially the like the motion of it. Like it was just on a tracks. Like the the first thing that comes to mind is how Kevin McAllister, his or the shack yeah, yeah. cut okay. out on the yeah. train track, you know, moving mm-hmm, in the window. Mm-hmm. It I mean it literally it's, looked like that. Well, I think it's Jordan. Was it Jordan? Yeah, well. Oh yes. yeah, I guess it would be. Because not only are they in Chicago, but even just oh, the time yeah. period, I think Jordan Yeah, was, Shaq was uh, still in high school probably. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now you know how much um, I think both of us really stopped paying attention to sports around the same time. But then I got back into it uh, probably in the last like mm. five or six years, I guess, especially with the Braves. And, I just uh, can't. And the Seahawks. Okay. I can't do Look. it. But I will say the the 90s Bulls team oh, was. Man. Golly. Man. Amazing. Unbelievable, dude. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, I mean, dude, I think first off, I just got to say thank you to everyone that's come along this journey, this uh, into the spooky and all that is amazing and fun about Halloween uh, mm-hmm. from this year's spooktacular. I think next year we're going to do it bigger. We're going to do it better. Special thank you again to all the listeners that sent us your spooky stories. Look, they were all amazing, truthfully. We amazing. really didn't know how we were going to craft this episode necessarily when this all first started. We just knew that we wanted to include some special stories from listeners and, and things like that. What we kind of ended up doing was, again, picking which one kind of stood out to us this year as the one that we wanted to share. So keep that in mind for next year. But uh, to our winner this year, Clay Keep your eyes out. We are sending you something super rad in the mail. Uh, yeah, I think man. you're going to love it. And again, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to send that over to us. Um, yeah, dude, thanks so much. It was uh, it was really great. And, um, you know, now you're part of the uh, That Would Be Rad history. Well, I think that's all the time. That Wait, hold on a second, mm-hmm. man. Hold on. Hold on, man. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay, cool, because I, like, hit something and turned off a lamp. Excuse me, half the thing dead. <laughs> Somebody's at the door here. Hold on. What is going on? What? Dude. What, did you take an Uber from L.A., dude? Oh, oh my gosh, guys. Listeners, this is insane. What is happening over there? Dude. I can't believe it's happening. We have a special treat for all you listeners out there. Straight from the Uber, direct from Los Angeles, co-host of the Bigfoot Collectors Club podcast. You know him from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. You love him from True Blood. The one. The only. Michael Michael McMillan. McMillan. He's here to tell you one of the craziest stories we've ever heard. Crazy. We asked him to share it with you, our audience. So without further ado... Take it away, Michael. Hey, guys. Uh, this is Michael McMillan from Bigfoot Collectors Club. Uh, I wanted to thank you for having me on the show, and here is my personal spooky story. This was actually an inspiration for the podcast that I do with Bryce Johnson and Riley Bray, um, or one of the inspirations, I should say, because I've always been into the unexplained and the paranormal Uh, I was fascinated by the X-Files growing up and shows like sightings. Uh, As a kid, I was terrified of being abducted by aliens. I thought that maybe I had been. No real evidence for that other than my own imagination, Uh, which is why this story was so strange. And I should preface this with uh, when this happened, which was on June 29th, 2016, I had just been to the, uh, I'd just been out to Roswell on a road trip with my good buddy that I grew up with back in Kansas about two weeks beforehand. So obviously aliens were on my mind 
but not at four o'clock in the morning when this story takes place. So on this particular night, I was asleep in bed. And at the time I had two dogs, my, my bulldog, Albie, who has since passed away and, and my terrier, Violet, who's still with us. And Violet was sleeping in my bedroom with me and Albie was sleeping out on the couch where he would often go because I think it was a little bit cooler out there. And um, I'm on a ground floor uh, building apartment and uh, my living room has a French doors that lead out to a patio and then a set of windows that uh, is right by the front door as you walk in um, that, that look out into... Uh, sorting the, the the driveway and the walkway for the building. It's a modular, like, 60s L.A. apartment complex, and, and there's, like, a little rock garden right out in front, uh, right below my windows. And there are, there at the time, were these lights that p- would project up into the palm trees in front of my window. And when the curtains were drawn, which they were this night, you know, it sort of you could see the shadows of the trees and the plants projecting up under the scrim of of my drapes. So anything standing in between those lights and my window would be projected in silhouette onto my window. So I wake up because I hear Albie doing a low growling in the living room. And I know what this growl is. It's his spook he's spooked or something is out you know there's an intruder or he hears something and it's just a real low grumble and and I wake up to it and I'm listening and he's just continuing this low growl and I know that if I don't go out there he's gonna start barking really loudly and that'll get my other dog barking wildly and I glance over it's I think it's this okay this part I can't remember now um I think it was 4 44 it was around four o'clock in the morning it's before 5 a.m 5 a.m I know that I think it was about 4 44 and I'm like ah crap and my first thought was my next door neighbor who works in film production film and tv I knew that he had, was doing a night shoot Um, because I often would babysit his dogs and then or his dog and uh, drop her off around midnight so I knew that he was getting home late and I thought well he's probably hearing uh, my neighbor Kyle come home and maybe that just spooked him but then he starts doing this woof 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 and then my dog my other dog perks up and I'm like no he wouldn't bark at Kyle like that and then all of a sudden he just erupts into this huge bark and then my my little dog shoots off the bed she dashes out in the living room and she's barking her her brains out and I'm thinking oh crap I'm gonna wake up the whole building so I get out of bed and I walk out into the living room standing in the little hallway between my bedroom and the living room and I stop dead in my tracks because I can see that the two of them are barking at the shadow of a figure that's being projected uh, against my drapes and I realize that something is looking in the window and instead of a silhouette of a what I would assume at first what I thought at first was like a prowler trying to break into my 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 window and also I live in LA we have you know there's sadly a homeless problem they're vagrants that will occasionally come through so I thought okay maybe there's a guy uh you know, out of his mind on drugs or just lost or some sad situation, just peeking into my windows. Um, All of this is just split second thoughts in my mind because when I get a good look at what I'm looking at, all I realize I'm seeing is a long, thin neck and a head, an oversized head that looks like an inverted spoon. And my first thought was, that looks like an alien. And, like, just cliche Steven Spielberg ending of Close Encounters of the Third Kind silhouette of an alien gray. That's exactly what it looked like. And my dogs are going apeshit, like I said. And as soon as I had that thought, this being, individual, figure, 
turned its head almost as if it was suddenly aware that I was there and I could see the head and neck undulate and it didn't move it moved in a very for lack of a better term alien-esque way um sort of where the head led and then the neck kind of rippled behind it. it was like watching a golf wedge kind of undulate and I could see in silhouette that the neck was fused at the back of the skull but it looked it didn't sit where it would sit on a human head it was more like kind of like ET or like a golf wedge but but its face wasn't as long as that the face looked like I don't play golf so I'm like thinking of like a, a the whatever the shortest roundest golf club would be that's what it would be I'm sure some of your listeners are like oh that's a that's that's this number you idiot uh, but once it moved like that, I went, oh, shit. You know, I didn't think, let me get my phone. Let me get this. I had no time to think all of this is happening within, like, you know, less than 30 seconds. Maybe more like 10. And I turned on the light. And then this thing ran ran away, ran off, ran, t- moved towards the back of my building. So I went after it i ran out onto my porch and looked down the direction that it went i couldn't couldn't see anything and my adrenaline is pumping and the dogs are going wild and uh to my right on his porch the neighbor who i knew was coming home late stepped out he was in his bathrobe and he said what's going on and i said did you just come home did you just come by my window and he's like no i've been home what's up and i said I didn't want to say the word alien, so I said, uh, <laughs> I said there was somebody looking in my window, and the dogs woke me up to it. And he goes, oh my God, dude, that's so freaky, because I've been watching Netflix in my bedroom for the past hour, and I could have sworn. So I kept taking off my headphones and looking around, because I could have sworn someone was watching me. And his patio doors op- were wide open, he was just... You know, so if there was something, it could have climbed over and gone into his apartment, as far as I know. Uh, so we did a sweep of the property. Couldn't find anything. My mind's racing. You know, if the dogs hadn't woken me up to it, and I know that they saw it, I would have thought I would have been dr- dreaming or hallucinating. I, of course, didn't go back to sleep that night. Um, and I can't explain what I saw. I don't. I know what it looked like but I can't tell you it was an alien. It, I even had Kyle stand where this thing was and the image, the shadow that a, you know, five foot nine grown man even hunched over uh, or crouching projected d- did not match this, this silhouette. It was completely, completely different and looked very human. So that's it. I don't know what happened. There was no strange lights that night. I didn't experience anything after that. I, of course, didn't go back to sleep. Um, but it was by far the weirdest thing I've ever seen. It made me question all of that, all of those fears of mine from childhood. I found it very strange that this happened after you know a recent trip to Roswell. Uh, but um, yeah, and I, you know, the thing that I've said, and I've told this story on the podcast. So if you've if you've listened to Bigfoot Collectors Club, I apologize for the repetitiveness of this story. But the thing that I keep coming back to, and now I'm more open to having uh, researched this stuff more in depth for the past three years, is I really felt like I was catching glimpse of something that was just passing through. Uh, might even be might even be terrestrial might even be from this planet or of this planet i don't know it it felt more like i was catching the glimpse of an elf or a leprechaun more than it was like i was catching a glimpse of an alien from a spaceship it felt like maybe this entity belongs here belongs to nature belongs to the Griffith Park, Hollywood Hills area that, you know, has obviously been around for a lot longer than civilization. Uh, Some of this area around here is considered to be haunted, uh, even cursed land. Um, And I've definitely had 
Um, I've definitely seen like orbs, like little tiny orbs pass through at night. I've woken up to weird feelings like I'm not alone in my room. So I've always kind of had a feeling that the house is, the, the, my apartment's not haunted, but there's something else existing in these hills. And um, and that's what it felt like. It felt like I saw something I that is very good at hiding from people and I wasn't supposed to see it. But I, I, I think, I like to think that it stopped to look in my window because it was, as it was passing through and maybe spying on my neighbor, it heard my bulldog snoring very loudly and wanted to look into the window to find out what what was making that noise because the when I walked out, you know, the two of them were looking at each other. And of course, I couldn't see any features of this thing through the I just saw a shadow. But I know because I was laying in bed for up to a minute before I went out there that Albie was growling at something and that was just when I woke up. So I think these two things, my dog was looking at this thing for a good minute or two before he decided, wait a minute, I don't like the cut of this person's jib. Um, So that's it. That's the story. Weirdest thing I've ever seen. Can't explain it. That was four years ago, four and a half years ago now. And I haven't had anything weird like that happen since. I've been worried that it would. It has not. Um, but if it does, I will certainly let, uh, I'll let, I'll let you guys know and I'll let our listeners know. Um, so that's my story. So thanks for letting me share it. I do want to tell, uh, your audience that Tyler did an amazing t-shirt for Bigfoot Collectors Club. I don't know, you know, if he's going to plug this or not on this show, but, uh, if you're a fan of his artwork, you got to check out this shirt. It's, uh, based on the old EC horror comics and it's for our October event, zombie Bigfoot's cryptic crypt, where we're just telling, you know, more ghost stories and sort of Halloween based stories this month, um, horror based stories. So, uh, I want you guys to check out this shirt. You can go to, uh, campfire.media and, uh, oh, sorry. We are campfire.media. That's our network. Click on shop and uh, you'll see it there. Tyler can throw up a link. It's super rad. I don't care uh, about it for us. I think you as Tyler fans would really dig it. So um, that's it. That's my shameless plug on Tyler's behalf. Um, All right. Well, thanks so much, guys. Happy Halloween. And uh, yeah, come join us for more spooky stories over at Bigfoot Collectors Club. Man, I told you guys absolutely terrifying you i know, love that story oh my gosh it's just like you know yours where there's like a motion detector mm-hmm. his there's like dogs bark you know it's like no matter what something was going on yeah you know for and sure it just i remember the first time i heard it on their show i mean i got chills i got chills right now yeah so michael thank you so much for um you know being a part of our October Spectacular, our first one ever. We're so brand new. It means the absolute world to us. Um, yeah, you guys are our favorite podcast, I mean, and it's such an honor. Absolutely, man. So thank you so much. And, uh, you know, Tyler said he was going to go have these on on that Uber bill. So just make sure you hit him <laughs> up. Yeah, I think that this time, I think that's all the time that we have. Uh, we hope you all have a safe and happy Halloween. And until next week, stay spooky. And be rad. <laughs>
through. 